Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our second keynote speaker, Professor Wright. His topic is when you hit a fork in the road, take it, what the latest controversies and data tell us about our field, open science, and the way forward. Please welcome Professor Wright. Thank you very, very much. I want to echo what Professor Sampson had to say in terms of uh, the graciousness which with uh, we have been treated and accepted into your country. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very humbling experience to be here in front of you. And I can tell you right now that uh, my, if my voice is trembling, it's because I'm rather nervous and rather <laughs> much in awe of being uh, in front of you. So thank you for the opportunity. And I hope uh, my talk is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, and I changed it at, at sort of at the last moment, uh, in part because I think the issue uh, is extremely important. And I thought, well, I could talk about biosocial and sort of the exciting things that are going on in, in, uh, in that area and the rapid advancement of technology and uh, what have you. But I thought this is more central to what we do day to day. And that is, what are the forces that impact criminologists? How do we produce evidence? What are the biasing factors uh, that come with those incentives and disincentives? And the reason that I bring this up is because I've, uh, I work a lot in the in uh, areas of individual uh, factors in crime. And if you work in that area, you work a lot with psychologists. And as I'll show you here in a second, right, the psych psychology has been going through a serious uh, soul searching um, event. I think we should too. I think we could step back, look at what other disciplines are doing, and follow their lead with the ultimate goal of improving our science. Dr. Sampson's discussed, for example, how we're using new technologies and Twitter feeds and social network analyses. And at the University of Cincinnati, we uh, have an area where policing folks pull in data from the city every day and create targeted offender check, uh, targeted offender lists where we can figure out who to target for uh, investigation and arrest and it's been very, very successful. So yes, there's a lot of new technology, it's very exciting, but some of the problems that we're going to encounter are the same problems that other fields are encountering. So today, let me just say criminology is probably better situated today than ever before uh, to provide answers to thorny policy questions and to make meaningful contributions to science. We have more PhD programs, and thus more people trained in the discipline. We have more data sets to draw on, to analyze, more statistical techniques to dazzle uh, readers with and to confuse them, uh, more journals to publish in, and consequently more studies to read and to try to figure out and to grapple with our discipline, once shunned by other fields, for example, and disparaged as nothing more than a marginal offshoot of sociology, has by any measure captured widespread intellectual attention and intellectual legitimacy. Today, criminologists from around the world contribute to an ongoing dialogue about crime, criminality, and the control of wayward behavior. Criminology seems to be at the height of its glory and influence. It's not bad. Given our gains, it may seem odd to sound a warning about our future, but that's exactly what I'm gonna to do today. As many businesses have learned, for example, often through insolvency, growth is relatively easy, especially when compared to maintaining a competitive edge uh, and expanding into further markets. Examples are everywhere, even in academic disciplines, moving leaps and bounds ahead of others, only to reach an apex where their decline was ruthlessly sudden or painfully drawn out. In the United States, we've recently seen major retail outlets uh, go bankrupt, including the once king of uh, retail, Sears, as other perennial giants, Enron, Compact, EF Hutt, and Bear Stearns. South Korea, too. Major shipping company, uh, Hanjin, went bankrupt while the auto manufacturer, General Motors of Korea, it remains on life support. The point, of course, is not that academic disciplines are subject to the same pressures 
as our major industries, but that the arc of success can stop. Sometimes suddenly, sometimes dramatically, and that progress is not guaranteed. I want to identify two interrelated risks to the continued expansion of our field. And the first is a set of practical or procedural issues that have become institutionalized in the discipline and in others. Collectively, these issues are embedded in a broader system that criminologists operate in, are affected by and respond to. The system is rooted in incentives and disincentives that when properly aligned can induce excellent science. Science that, is, whoops, science that is reliable, accurate, and can be replicated. When misaligned, however, the combinations of incentives and disincentives can propel us away from rigorous and replicatable science and into the land where falsehoods are embraced and touted as obviously correct. The second risk is one of intellectual culture that if not addressed and changed, will neutralize any gains made by altering the procedures by which we do science. Intellectual culture is a nebulous concept. But what I'm referring to here is the collective willingness of our discipline to embrace the highest principles of science. Murad discussed four what he called communism or the sharing of information, ideas, data, findings, disinterestedness or objectivity, universalism, and critically organized skepticism. Feynman, the famous research theoretical physicist, excuse me, summarized the principles of rigorous research as a kind of scientific integrity that corresponds with a kind of, quote, utter honesty. For Feynman, the utter honesty involved the meticulous reporting of anything that could invalidate your study, as well as embracing contradictory findings that may uh, invalidate your theory. Prior to Merton, prior to Feynman, we have Nietzsche. I've always wanted to cite Nietzsche in a paper, so I finally got to do so. <clears throat> Nietzsche discussed intellectual honesty, or what he also called an intellectual conscience. For Nietzsche, the will to knowledge involved the scrupulous exercise of logic and judgment in the pursuit of evidence that could or may not lead to the acceptance of a belief. Nietzsche foreshadowed much of what cognitive psychology now tells us about the formation and continuation of belief structures, namely that beliefs that bring with them benefits are more likely to be formed independent of evidence. That, as Jenkins states, our worldview is composed of untruths, firmly held beliefs for which our evidence is radically inadequate. These untruths, Nietzsche argued, and science now confirms, shape our tendency to form and evaluate new beliefs. Untruths, thus he, he concluded, are condition of life. I think Nietzsche would have been very interested with the fake news issue. With Nietzsche's warning in mind, what happens when researchers advertently or inadvertently embrace untruths? Or when entire disciplines sacralize or make sacred, John Hayes word, areas of study? wall them off to investigation, allow only certain types of narratives. What then? Because we have seen that as well. What happens when the incentives of our scientific, scientific enterprise become misaligned and promote shades of truth or untruth and sometimes even shoddy signs? This is the question of culture that I want to address as I believe it is far more pernicious than matters of methodology. All of us owe a debt of gratitude 
to a psychologist named Daryl Bim. Professor Bim from Cornell took eight years, nine experiments, a thousand subjects, to show that human beings were capable of what he called precognition, ESP, extrasensory perception. That is knowing the future. According to Bim, the odds that eight of his nine studies could be due to chance were 74 billion to one. Fairly impressive. And his study was published in a peer-reviewed journal, the journal Personality and Social Psychology. Bim's work was greeted with skepticism, to say the least, and also a flash of dread. Nobody accused him of fraud. Nobody accused him of being sloppy. His methods were standard experimental science and psychology, and his work adhered to basic precepts of science. Yet there it was, a study comporting to scientific standards showing something that was physically impossible. The implications were immediately clear. If BIM's study produced results that were not possible, how many other studies employing equally or more rigorous designs also produced incorrect results? LaBelle and Peters summed up the problem that BIM's work posed for psychology. They stated BIM deserves praise for his commitment to experimental rigor and the clarity with which he reports procedures and analyses which generally exceed the standard of modal research practices in the field. That being said, it is precisely because BIM's report is objectively of high quality that it is diagnostic of potential problems with modal research practices. By using accepted standards for experimental, analytical, and data reporting, yet arriving at a fantastic conclusion, BIM put empirical psychologists in a difficult position forced to consider either revising beliefs about the fundamental nature of time and causality or revising beliefs about the soundness of their work. Perhaps because psychologists make terrible theoretical physicists, most chose to examine the quality of the work and the practices that they employ. Hence, the replication crisis was born not out of fraud or malfeasance, although psychology has had uh, suffered from both, but by the faithful application of the scientific method. The story, of course, is rich in irony, but there were voices prior uh, to Bim calling for reform. One of those voices was John Iadonidas. Apologize if I continually mispronounce his name, who in a masterpiece of organized skepticism boldly pro proclaimed that most published research findings were false. Iodine offered six color, uh, corollaries to guide scholars on the likelihood that any one of their findings would be incorrect. And we can consider these corollaries as a precursor to the replication problems and for what they mean to criminology. For example, you can see here, the smaller the studies, uh, the smaller the studies conducted in the scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, J.C. Barnes, analyzed as, uh, the body of work in criminology. The average sample size right now in, in the field is about 400 still, uh, still relatively small. The smaller the effect size in a scientific field, the less likely research findings are to be true. The average effect size in criminology is right around 0.1. We are a field full of small effects. We can go through the rest of these, but I think you get the point that even prior to BEM and prior to the replication crisis, people were saying what we're doing is producing uh, problematic research, research that may not be completely trustworthy. Iodine went on to explain that most findings in most areas were false positives and may often uh, be simply accurate measures of prevailing bias. To improve research quality, he suggested larger scale studies aimed at testing major concepts where the pre-study probability was already high, moving away from null hypothesis testing, which has become quite controversial pre-registration of studies. In other words, changing the scientific processes and methods. 
However, he also called for a change in research culture and the, quote, curtailing of prejudices. He then recommended that large-scale studies with minimal bias should be performed, and then perhaps validating BIM's study on ESP, he forecasted, and I quote, I suspect several established classics will fail the test. The period since BIM and his now famous or infamous study, depending on your perspective, has witnessed remarkable scholarly work in the area of replication. Research teams from around the world were mobilized and guided by Iodinus' insight. And then they keenly decided to attempt to replicate all of the major studies in psychology, studies that had been taught for decades as fact. And one by one, just as Iodinus predicted a decade earlier, they fell. These are just a handful of the studies that have failed to replicate. And as you can see, some of the larger ones, uh, Milgram study on compliance, the Zimbardo Stanford prison study, if you followed that, it's been quite controversial uh, with, with uh, accusations of fraud and impropriety and so forth. Uh, but there are others, ego depletion, stereotype threat, Mozart effect, even though I love Mozart, uh, and then the various implicit bias tests. The first worldwide effort to examine replication of scientific work involved 100 studies published in three psychology journals analyzed by 270 researchers. And the results were disappointing. 97% of the original studies reported significant results, but only 36% of the replication studies produced significant results. Less than 50% of the original effect sizes fell within 95% replication confidence intervals. The effect sizes were half on average, half as large as what were initially reported. 38% of effects were classified as having replicated, but again, the replication effect sizes were so small as to be of questionable value. Studies from social, social psychology had the highest failure rate at 74%, uh, compared to the cognitive psychology at around 47%. So the take home message was clear. Studies that form the backbone of psychology, many that involved rigorous experimental designs, could not be replicated. Those that could had effect sizes much lower in magnitude than originally reported. So not only did the studies not replicate, even if they did, they're accompanied by effect sizes that were questionable. This slide shows as a summary um, provided by psychologist uh, Samine uh, Vizier at UC Davis. And these are a series of replication efforts across labs and across places. You can see that the overall total replication rate is only 45%. 55% false discovery rate, and that's with large uncertainties. Also understand that this is not only in psychology or social psychology, but medicine, including clinical trials and cancer research. Bayer and other large corporate uh, organizations have also reported being able to, not being able to replicate their own work. So what was responsible? Short order, the empirical attention turned to understanding the processes uh, that imperiled replication efforts. Few believed, at least initially, that research fraud was sufficiently pervasive uh, to account for the lack of replication. However, right, scholars for some time have been warning from, about the various intentional and unintentional processes engaged in the create, that create unreliable findings. Indeed, Charles Babbage, 1830, uh, use the analogy of the cook, quote, cooking data to describe the process of selective reporting of observations. And summarizing the various degrees of freedom exercised by research, uh, Simmons and his colleagues uh, 
discuss undisclosed flexibility in data collection and analysis that we all enjoy. Many of the terms that they use quickly enter the researcher vernacular, including p-hacking, p-harking, asterisk hunting, and data dredging. Indeed, Witcher's so far has documented about 34 degrees of freedom that can occur throughout the research process. Decisions that we make that can be reasonable, can be justified, and ultimately, ultimately still lead to findings that cannot be replicated. These degrees of freedom have become better known as questionable research practices and involve everything from fraud and fabrication to manipulating data to boost P levels. Research on uh, QRPs usually, uh, typically involves the administration of self-report surveys and about individual conduct as well as colleagues' conduct. There are also official databases that can be examined. Research on QR, uh, QRP converge on three related findings. First, data fraud and data fabrication appear rare. That's very good news. Official estimates, which are clearly downwardly biased, suggest that fabrication, fraud, and plagiarism affect less than 1% of studies. Self-reported studies also find relatively low rates of serious data fraud, typically between 1% to 2% for fraud and 7% for plagiarism. That said, systematic fraud can go undetected and has been gone undetected for decades and can involve dozens and dozens of papers. Diedrich Stapel, uh, for example, a Dutch social psychologist, published over 130 articles, 24 book chapters. Uh, many of those articles published in the top journals of the field was found to have falsified most of his work. And I'll add, when asked how he would successfully got away with it, his answer, I thought, was illuminating. I told reviewers what they wanted to hear. Second, the prevalence of less serious questionable practices is substantial. Here, estimates range from 30 to almost 80% of researchers who admit uh, to engaging in at least one questionable practice. John Lowenstein and, and uh, Prelick, for example, surveyed over 2,000 psychologists about their use of these practices. What they found, about 10% of psychologists admitted to data fabrication, outright data fabrication, with large majorities admitting to other questionable practices, such as not reporting all aspects of the dependent measure, collecting more data after the results were already known, selectively reporting uh, studies that worked, and excluding data after knowing what the impact would be. Third, when asked about the behavior of their peers, researchers report widespread use of questionable practices. That's when we tell on each other. Um, <clears throat> Fernelli's 2009 meta-analysis found that 14% of researchers knew colleagues who had committed serious fraud and 72% who had engaged in questionable practices. Similar patterns have been found also in medicine and the health sciences. Of particular concern to us, social scientists, are the practices of p-hacking and harking. P-hacking involves researchers trying various combinations of statistical models until the desired results are achieved. In a sense, the key variable reached some arbitrary 0.05 threshold, which is then justified uh, as, as justification for publication. Importantly, however, uh, readers are never told of the efforts engaged in to reach these types of findings. Studies show that p-hacking is widespread and in some ways appears to be standard practice even in our field. It is in some ways how we train people. A lesser known but equally problematic questionable practice is that of harking. And according to Rubin, harking refers to hypothesizing after the results are known. Harking involves researchers combing through data, conducting various statistical tests to support uh, uh, until support is found for their hypotheses. If the results are contrary to initial hypotheses, however, new hypotheses are created and then passed off in the research report as original. We didn't find what we expected, but we found what we expected. The readers that's led to believe that the researchers confirm their hypotheses. 
Rubin summary of studies in the self-reported harking, uh, shown here, finds about 27% and 58% of scholars engage in this behavior with a mean of about 43%. This is a self-report um, Elsevier, Trust in Science, and this is from scientists. And what you can see here is that even scientists are now growing increasingly skeptical of science. Cure questionable practices appear to be engaged in with an eye towards achieving statistical significance for parameters of interest. Examination of journal publications has decidedly shown that null effects are rarely ever reported, especially now in the social sciences. Fernelli studied over 4,600 papers published between 1990 and 2007. In the social sciences, positive results were over twice as likely to be published than were null results. a trend that has increased over time. By the end of the study period, over 90% of study results found in social science journals were statistically positive. Given the standard statistical thresholds, a 90% confirmation rate would seem improbable. And clearly, we have either achieved a remarkable level of insight into complex social behavior, or our studies and the systems that we use to vet our studies are not up to the task. Researchers, of course, are not stupid people. But like anyone else, they respond to incentives and disincentives that can affect their careers. By any measure, publishing articles, especially in high-impact journals, has become the sole metric by which all else is judged. Graduate students hitting the job market now often have a dozen or more publications compared to just a few years ago. Junior scholars now go up for tenure with 30, even 60 or more publications on their record. And senior faculty, of course, may have produced hundreds and hundreds of publications over their career. I am not against productivity at all. What I'm trying to point out here is that publication, for all intents and purposes, has become the currency through which status is gained. Wealth is increased and value is evaluated. What this has led to is increasing expectations for the rapid accumulation of publications and for continuity in year-to-year -year publication rates. As our sociological brethren have found, unreasonable standards can cause people to employ alternative strategies to achieve success. The use of questionable research practices thus becomes a rational reaction to careerist demands and perhaps more importantly, to the demands of publishing outlets. Namely, that the results reported are novel, statistically significant, and tell us a good story. Since positive novel findings are more likely to get published, there are few career incentives for scholars to pursue studies that may produce insignificant results. P-hacking and other questionable methods may thus be born out of both ignorance of scientific formalism and an accurate assessment of the conditions necessary to achieve success in publication. That said, the expectation of journal editors and reviewers uh, have played a critical, critical role in incentivizing the use of questionable practices and the resulting lack of reliability in the criminological database. To be blunt, I expect most published results in criminology are the product of questionable practices and that few studies would replicate if such attempts were made. We are no different in this respect than other disciplines. The almost exclusive reliance on reaching arbitrary statistical thresholds, combined with the use of widespread use of questionable practice, is both a response to and an effect of various biases. I've already mentioned a few of these, such as strong preference for statistical significance and novelty, but there are others. Editors have their own views of what constitutes good science, of course, and sometimes those reviews don't mirror good science. And as anyone who has published can tell you, editors can kill or smooth the pathway for a paper as they seem fit. Reviewers, too, sometimes have their own agendas. Science is imperfect. The processes we employ are imperfect. But the processes are there to protect science from us. 
These issues were empirically examined by Gerber uh, and his colleagues who studied three years of publications in the American Sociological Review, the American Journal of Sociology, and Sociological Court. Using a caliper test, they found strong evidence of publication bias across all three journals. Indeed, the chance of attaining the distributions of statistically significant results called from these journals exceeded 1 to 15,000 to 1 to 100,000, depending on the cutoff imposed. Publication bias distorts science by providing false or misleading picture of scientific findings. Sometimes this distortion creates an illusion of scientific consensus on an issue, while at other times the absence of null results is taken as evidence that they in fact do not exist. Either way, science becomes more illusory and misleading, and scientific correction becomes less probable. A reasonable critique might ask, well, what about replication in the social sciences? A group of 24 scholars attempted to replicate social science experiments published in the top journals of the world, nature and science, between 2010 and 2015. Similar to earlier Open Science Foundation studies on replication, this research team could only replicate 13 of the original 21 studies, with replication rates ranging from 57 to 67 percent. Effect sizes, too, were approximately one half of those reported in the initial studies. The authors argued that the presence of false positives combined with inflated effect sizes of true positives contributed to replication failures. Combined, however, the results show that even with randomized experimental trials from studies published in top journals in the world, that the chance for successful replication was not much better than the flip of a coin. Turning now to culture and how to create a credible research culture. The problems I've discussed represent deviations from scientific process. They are sometimes manipulated openly, sometimes they're the product of practices that have just grown organically. Nonetheless, the issue of culture is one that is critical. In large part because if the cultural issues are not addressed, then changing the scientific processes will be moot. The embrace of scientific principles seems, at least to me, to be the precondition for effective reform in the scientific mechanisms. But let me suggest before I discuss how to create that culture, how not to create that culture. Some of you may know that there's a slight crisis in the field right now in terms of a number of papers being retracted and the mechanisms used to arrive at those decisions. <clears throat> Let me emphasize that I have absolutely nothing against the authors or the individuals involved in this very complex drama. I do not envy their positions, the decisions they have to make, or the relationships that will undoubtedly be harmed. Nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that about every mistake that could be made in handling this issue has been made, and that is nothing short of astonishing how poorly these allegations have been managed by our discipline. The comedy of errors has been an embarrassment, to be quite frank, and unfortunately appears as though many efforts were made to avoid on acting on these allegations. This is not uncommon. Major Organizations do the same thing. Corporations do the same thing. We are no different. Accusations of research malfeasance, especially of data fabrication, are the most serious that can be leveled at a scholar. Indeed, the mere accusation has the ability to forever taint one's career. However, once made, two processes should kick in, both of which are rooted in scientific values. First, in keeping with the highest principles of science, the accused could make every effort to actually show the data, produce the information. In situations where special conditions apply, such as where confidentiality is involved, 
Alternative mechanisms can easily be arranged. Errors, if made, can be claimed and the scientific record corrected. Second, the allegations cannot be resolved. Innocence must still be presumed and all due process rights protected, but the allegations should still be adjudicated. This is how we hold ourselves accountable. The adjudicatory process should be guided by the principles of impartiality and objectivity. Unfortunately, these principles gave way in this case, and they gave way to a collective self-interest where each actor took steps to shield themselves or others uh, or to adjudicate the motives of the whistleblower in public. The primary <coughs> scientific questions concerning the accuracy and reliability of the published research results were treated as a tertiary issue of little importance. Indeed, the editor of our top journal, Criminology, admitted that, quote, other gibberish had also been published in the journal and that nothing was done. Even being charitable, I find it difficult to defend the cavalier disregard for scientific accuracy and integrity. The eventual retraction of four, now five papers, with more looming, with the potential for others uh, still on the horizon, did not resolve this issue. Again, my intention is not to cast aspersions at, an, at individual actors, but to situate their actions in a broader context of institutional incentives and constraints. Incentives and constraints that can easily become misaligned. If we value transparency, for example, we would be able to examine the processes that led to so many papers being published in top journals without reviewers or editors catching some fairly obvious mathematical problems. We would know if the errors were caught and explained away, who reviewed the papers, whether the reviews were sufficient. In short, we would know why the papers were accepted for publication by editors and whether correctable errors were made. An emphasis on the scientific value of transparency would allow answers to these questions. After all, a good faith effort may have been made by all involved. Transparency, objectivity, and ruthless honesty are guiding scientific values that have been proven over many generations to lead to better science. Scientific values matter. And like Bishop in her recent address, it's important that we understand the mechanisms that maintain bad practices in individual humans. Bad science, she astutely notes, is usually done because somebody mistook it for good science. In this case, many miss people, many people mistook bad science for good, and we might want to know why. Perhaps, however, we don't. Instead, perhaps, maybe we wish to be deliberately ignorant. And before you dismiss my comment as that of a cynic, Know that deliberate ignorance is oftentimes a rational, even desirable state. Hurtling and Engel, for example, tell us that deliberate ignorance is often preferred because it increases regret avoidance, because it can be in performance enhancing, and because it can be used strategically to avoid responsibility and liability. Deliberate ignorance is often perceived to increase impartiality and to help us maintain a range of preferred beliefs. Deliberate ignorance is, as many say, a sensible, short-term response to information that may be accompanied by psychological and emotional burdens. Not knowing, in other words, excuses our obligations to change in light of new information. The title of the talk was, When You Reach a Fork in the Road, Take It. And I want to conclude here, not by continually sort of hammering the discipline or drawing out examples where we have fallen down, but to say that this is a remarkable opportunity, 
crises often provide us opportunities to reevaluate what we do and how we do it. And this crisis is no different. If we look at what psychology has done in turning a very difficult situation into one where new data were collected, new insights emerged, new tests were developed, because now psychology can actually test to see uh, with various algorithms the, whether certain uh, articles have been fabricated or types of processes have been engaged in, uh, then I think we can advance, we can move forward. We can have a science that is credible, objective, legitimate, and that informs our policy. But that requires a cultural change and an awareness of the incentives and the disincentives that can sometimes converge in time and place to produce erroneous results. Not all of criminology is afflicted by this, of course, and I think most people engage in a very good faith effort to get science right. But too often I think we now see where forces that are affecting individual criminologists just like forces affect everyone else alter that commitment to scientific process and formalism. Let's take this as an opportunity, reevaluate what we do. I suggest moving towards an open science framework with pre-registered studies, where you lay out what you're going to do, the types of measures you're going to use prior to doing this. This helps reduce p-hacking and other types of mechanisms. Also, psychology has arrived at a number of checklists that I've also placed in the slides, that allow us to better evaluate statistical models so that we do not slide into that when we're at home working, running uh, data. There are many mechanisms that we can now employ that we didn't have before. Let's learn from our colleagues in other fields, import that into our science, and become better. And with that, I would say thank you for the opportunity to be up here in front of you great colleagues.